Um, I am really not the kind of person that usually gives this kind of distinguished lecture series. I'm not an academic, I'm not a scholar in the sense that I don't belong to any of the guilds. I'm uh, a preacher. I do have some scholarly credentials, but still, I don't fit the profile, and I'm not only profoundly honored to be here, but also a little intimidated by the task of following my extraordinarily distinguished processes in this role, but also speaking to a congregation that I don't know much about. I don't know a whole lot about who you are, where you've come from theologically, liturgically, ecclesiastically. I know this is a Baptist seminary, Baptist college, highly regarded by a great many people I care about. And, uh, and yet, I have to ask the Lord to give me, by His Spirit, a sense of who you are and where you are. He knows that. I don't really need to know that because He knows that. And may He, by His Word, speak today. May the Word that I speak be truly God's Word. Um, The name of this um, series is By the Word Worked, and that is indeed the overarching theme of everything that I'm going to do in the three lectures. Like a lot of uh, scholars, I am working on a new book, and these lectures will eventually find their way into that book in some form. Um, I'm just beginning to get it in order. The three lectures will be grounded in the doctrine of the Word of God, and therefore it may seem at times that the subject of all three of these sermons is preaching. Now, not all of you are preachers or intend to be preachers by any means, so you may think that these lectures are not for you, but I hope you will find that not to be the case, because every Christian, lay or ordained, has an enormous stake in the preaching of the church. Indeed, a life or death stake. And I hope to show in the third lecture that I mean that literally. The Gospel Sermon is not a performance by one person for the consumption by another group of people. The sermon is a work in which the congregation and the preacher are both actively participating. That's why sermons published in books are always second best. When a sermon is actually preached, there should be an alchemy between the preacher and the hearers, an alchemy which can't be predicted or forced. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't, as I well know from long experience, because when it is out of our hands, the sermon, the Holy Spirit blows where it wills. I can tell you this, that alchemy is most likely to happen when the sermons are preached week in and week out to the same congregation by a minister who is renewed each week by the Word. Somebody like Aaron over here. When that happens, the work of the sermon is shared in an ongoing context of mutual commitment and by God's will when it's really working, mutual love. Now, in addition to this point about the lectures being addressed, my lectures, this two days being addressed not only to preachers but also to those who are hearers. I have a concern about who I'm speaking to, as I said before. I operate within the mainline churches, and to some extent, surprisingly, my work seems to appeal to Roman Catholics, which has been quite a surprise to everyone. <laughs> uh, much cherished, I'm going to Rome next year to teach at one of the Vatican colleges, if you can imagine that. My readership in the mainline churches, however, as far as I can tell, is only from a small slice of those traditional Protestant denominations. 
A larger audience or readership seems to be from the non-denominational congregations, the breakaway denominations, the so-called evangelical churches. So this presents a bit of a problem about how I speak to this particular baptist inflected congregation. I am mainline to the core, but within the main lines, I represent a traditional reformed outlook which is increasingly weakening even among the Presbyterians, let alone the Episcopalians. <laughs> so I am here standing on solid reform ground, God willing. Um, I've been working on that fault line between the main lines and the evangelical denominations all my life, but I may not be precisely addressing your specific situation. I hope that you will be able to adjust accordingly. I can say this much, I'm not going to be talking about the evangelical far right. That will not be on my spectrum. That is an easy target, target tempting other Christians, other Christian bodies, to smug and self-righteous disdain. Rather, I'm going to try to speak to the people who I believe probably make up most of the audience here today, who, beginning with the mainline process and stretching away, to the uh, multifarious non-denominational and breakaway Protestant bodies are largely, mostly, well-educated like yourself. So to begin with, I'm going to set out to debunk two common notions about Christian preaching that you might have heard. The first one is true in one sense. It is true that the congregation of hearers and the preacher in the pulpit are working together. That is absolutely right. But the second part of this notion, which I have heard, is that the, the preachers and the hearers are like actors putting on a performance and God is the audience. And not only is God the audience, but God is watching to see what fruit will be produced. I don't know if you've heard that a lot, but I've heard it quite a lot. And that's the way a lot of mainline preaching sounds to me at the moment. The second part, notion, which I hear about once a week, I heard it at a funeral last Saturday, is supposedly a saying of St. Francis, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Francis never said that. He didn't. Maybe one of his followers did, but he didn't. But it is quoted like holy writ in the circles I frequent. I hear it all the time. Now we understand the thought behind it. A gospel preached without the fruits of the Spirit would not be the gospel. But this airy dismissal of words as though they were unimportant needs to be struck down wherever it pops up because it leads to a wholesale abandonment of the crucial biblical identification of God with his word. Our God is a God of words, a God who names himself, a God who lavishly communicates God's own self to us. That is his very nature. Our God is one who speaks to us in order to establish his purpose for us. The ultimate expression of God's word is the Son of God himself, who spent his entire life on earth revealing the Father through his teaching. Now, of course, it's true that Jesus performed works and that Jesus revealed God in his actions. The signs, as John calls them. But Jesus' signs do not speak for themselves. They come with words of revelation, words that reveal who Jesus is and why he is doing what he does. In an often read passage from Luke, I believe it's illustrated on a window, Jesus inaugurates his ministry in the synagogue at Capernaum, reading from the scroll, the book of Isaiah, where the prophet defines the signs of the kingdom of God. Everybody's looking over there. I think it's the first window, isn't it? Okay, reading from the scroll? Okay, let me get you back again. <laughs> the signs of the kingdom of God, 
captives are released, the blind recover their sight, those who are oppressed are delivered. So far, so good. But Jesus does not stop there. He rolls up the scroll, hands it to the attendant, sits down, which is the teaching position, and says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. With these words, he announces himself as the long-awaited Messiah, the one who will inaugurate the reign of God in his own presence. With these words, he announces himself. The crowd, recognizing that this is a man whom they know as a local boy, the son of Joseph the carpenter, is now claiming too much for himself. His words, which first appeared gracious, become offensive to them. I'm going to return to this passage from Luke and Isaiah and Lecture 3. As Hebrews teaches, and as this story from Luke illustrates, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any true-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's pretty scary, don't you think? But it is precisely that double-edged Word of God that not only speaks in Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, but is actually incarnate in him as the word come to earth to dwell among us. Listen again to the beginning of the book of Genesis, the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Everything we believe about God is predicated on three words. And God said. Without that, there is no story and there is no gospel. God created the universe through speaking. Let there be light, the first words of creation. Every time I think about that, it shakes me up. Without that, without those words, without God's speaking, there is no story and no gospel. God called all people into existence by speaking to Moses. God commissioned the prophets to speak, to be God's voice. And in the opening words of Hebrews, we read, in many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. The Son reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. Jesus Christ upholds the universe by his word of power. I think many good church goers today have not entirely taken that in. The unique feature of the God of the Bible, a feature found nowhere else in religion, is the centrality of the Word of God. The Word of God, the Word of power, is the foundation of everything else. The story of our redemption after the fall in the Garden of Eden begins with these words, and God spoke to Abraham. Let us not hear any more about this gospel of works with words tacked on as a mere option. Hebrews again, see that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. Notice that God is identified precisely as the one who speaks. 
My own ministry of preaching takes me into pulpits in many different denominations, and I also hear sermons every Sunday in a variety of Episcopal churches. I will just say that as I travel around, I get the impression that most congregations don't seem to have a sense of the biblical doctrine of the Word of God. They don't expect anything life-changing from the sermon. There is no excitement about the sermon, no anticipation. Again, not true with Aaron. In the, go to St. Albans Church. <laughs> In the Episcopal Church, it's the liturgy and the communion that get people to come and that keep them coming, if they come at all. It hasn't always been that way, though. For 14 years, I preached in an Episcopal Church in New York City. It was quite the opposite. Grace Church in New York, in Greenwich Village. People largely come largely young, excuse me, largely young congregation, and they came because they expected an event of the Word of God every Sunday and every Wednesday, too. And as they found that happening, they found each other as well. Many, many, many marriages and deep, lifelong friendships. Once you've preached in an atmosphere with this sort of synergy, you're really not satisfied with anything less. This kind of expectation keeps us preachers fresh. This expectation is the work of the congregation, and it should cre create excitement from Sunday to Sunday. For the preacher, it is always a sobering, even scary responsibility. But the preacher is carried and borne up by the promise of God that the preacher will be used as a vessel for God's living word. Parenthetically, and for the record, the Church of Calvary St. George's in Manhattan has more or less taken over that role where the Mockingbird conferences take place. My overall theme, then, for these three lectures is by the word worked. Now, this is supposed to be witty. This is a borrowing from classical theological teaching. Seminary, seminary students and clergy will recognize the Latin phrase ex opere operata, by the word work. Maybe that's not so important to Baptists, but us Episcopalians <laughs> definitely um, get into that. Um, this phrase, ex opere operata, by the work worked, refers to a dispute about the fitness of clergy to perform the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Suppose the presiding minister has engaged in notorious sin. Would that negate the effect of the service performed? Would a baptism by such a person be invalid? The Roman Catholic Church at the Keller Reformation Council of Trent decided that it would be valid regardless of the character of the officiant. The sacrament itself was of God and therefore had power to override the unworthiness of the presiding priest. It was ex opere operata, by the work worked. Well, taking off from that, I devised the theme, by the word worked. It doesn't work in Latin, but in English, I found it a snappy way to reveal the true authors of the scriptures and, by gracious extension, the words spoken by those who inherit the mantle of the apostolic preaching and those who listen to it. The effective agent in the true gospel sermon is not the preacher, not the listener, not even the synergistic energy that is produced when preachers and listeners are interacting at the level of the gospel. God is not the audience. God is the animating agency inhabiting the written text as the preacher is led by the Holy Spirit, speaking words that effect, that bring into being what God intends. The most precious gift that God gives to preachers is listeners with an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Blessed are those who find themselves in congregations where this is understood and where the eagerness for the word each Lord's day is a sign that God is on the move. 
Now, what I've said so far is an introduction to the theme by the word worked, a presentation of the biblical doctrine of the word of God and the, its role in the preaching of the church. Now, the second half of this lecture will be the beginning of an attempt to build something constructive in the midst of what I see as a preaching desert in many of the churches, sometimes even in self-identified evangelical congregations who pride themselves on their pastor's preaching. I'll be trying to build this up throughout these three lectures. I think I may have made a mistake in calling this first sermon, all this stuff about postmodernism, that may have been an error, but um, having done that, I am going to wade in and see if I can make myself comprehensible. I believe that these trends that I'm about to identify <coughs> are trends which have had grave effects on pulpits. So first I'll identify the trends, and then second I will respond to them by saying something that I hope will be encouraging. And then this afternoon I'm going to attempt to say something further about the theme of power which lies at the heart of the postmodern agenda. So, four trends in postmodernism that I believe have weakened all of our preaching. As I've already suggested, our faith in the power of the Word of God has become significantly weakened by trends, not only from academia, but also from our present politics. These trends have influenced the churches, particularly in the suspicion of the notion of power. This has resulted in congregations that don't expect sermons to be powerful events of the living word of God. I'll be adapting that throughout these three lectures, trying to show how, agenda, how the postmodern agenda can be adjusted to strengthen not only the confidence of preachers, but also the expectations of the hearers. So then, here are four trends in postmodernism that I believe have weakened preaching. To some extent, they blend into one another, but I've separated them for the purpose of emphasis. One, we have forgotten how to be theological. We haven't even noticed that our sermons have become anthropological. We have made human potential and human possibility the center of our biblical interpretation. And that, I find, has sneaked into even the most supposedly evangelical preaching. Human potential, human possibility. I'll talk about that more as we go on. Number two. Number one is we've forgotten how to be theological and have become anthropological. Number two, sermons depict an all-loving, all-accepting, all-embracing, but passive God, who is the object of our religious search. Instead of the God who has made an epical journey to us even unto death, God's journey to us, instead of that journey, we hear incessantly, more and more every day I find, of our faith journey in search of God. I'd like to have a dollar for every preacher I've heard get up and say, we're all on a journey. That has become the center of the gospel story. But it's not. More about that later. <laughs> when we talk about our faith journeys all the time, we have taken the spotlight away from God and directed, toward, directed the spotlight toward ourselves and our own doings, even our own so-called spiritual efforts. So as a result of this, sermons threaten to become hortatory or therapeutic rather than revelatory events. Three, and I'll talk about this considerably later on, a Jesus charisma message 
a Jesus charisma of Jesus' selected words and deeds, endlessly retold, has replaced the Christ charisma of the evangelists, the apostles, the church fathers, and the reformers. This is true of almost every sermon I hear in the main lines today. I'll talk about the Jesus Karima and the Christ Karima later tonight, I believe. Four, sermons tend to be timid. They lack a sense of urgency. Preachers, I find, seem to be afraid of too much power. I think mainline preachers have become so reluctant to be mistaken or so fearful of being mistaken for television evangelists that they have been in full flight in the opposite direction. <laughs> so those are the four trends I've identified. Now I'm going to offer counter proposals or counter affirmations to each one. First counter, -aff counter affirmation, this is a counter affirmation uh, having to do with preaching particularly and hearing. First counter affirmation, the word of God is above all powerful. Well, Wilhelm has written, preaching is always a reenactment of the primal miracle and God said. This is the fundamental presupposition of all Christian preaching. The entire Christian enterprise and the biblical story itself stands or falls on this premise, God has spoken. Now to whom has he spoken? First of all, to the prophets, evangelists, and apostles. But now, brothers and sisters, he speaks to us and through us when we have put ourselves into the service of his word, whether we are preachers ourselves or not. The preacher is actually an agent of the word of God. It has nothing to do with our worth and worthiness. Nothing. It is all by the word worked. Whatever I say that is not worked by the word is chaff, and may he throw it away. Now, this is clearly known, clearly shown, excuse me, throughout the scriptures. The prophets and the apostles were bearers of the living word, not because they were spiritually gifted, but because they were commandeered by God. Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak. I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me. <coughs> but the Lord said, notice that, but. The Lord can overcome every but. <coughs> behold, I do not know how to speak. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I do not know how to speak. Do not say, I am only a youth, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. That's the Lord speaking to Jeremiah. Now here is Paul, the apostle speaking to you and to me. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. For the scripture says, no one who believes in Jesus Christ will be put to shame. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are people to call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? And can there be any doubt about who Paul means that does the sin? Not some local committee appointed to justify your ordination. 
we are sent by the Spirit of God. By the Word of God. And so I hope that many of you see how this, these texts put preaching and hearing with faith, both preaching and hearing with faith, at the very center of who God is and who we are as believers. Second kind of proposal. The subject of the verb is God. You'll remember the slogan of the Clinton, Clinton or maybe you won't actually, many of you, the, the uh, slogan of the Clinton presidential campaign. It's the economy, stupid. Richard Hayes, the former dean of the Duke Divinity School, told me that when the, in the days that when he was preaching, or teaching rather, teaching the New Testament introductory course, he would write up on the driveway, it's about God, stupid. <laughs> My calling and your calling is to attend to what the Bible says about God. I'm going to interject something that's not in my manuscript. Um, Beverly Levanta was teaching at Princeton for a long time, and I knew her quite well at Princeton. She, of course, is at Babel now, on her way retiring, retiring, I guess, but still very much here. Um, I, was, I saw Beverly in Princeton, hadn't seen her for quite a while, and I asked her what she was up to, and she said she was writing a book a commentary on Acts, and I said, she and I both had the same professor, so I said, Acts? Hmm. Oh, because Acts has been, has been described as the most uh, disputed book of the New Testament. So I said, well, what angle are you going to take on Acts in your commentary? And she said, it's a boat, God. <laughs> um, that was a great moment. I've never ceased to tell that because it was so much to the point. Acts is about God. The whole Bible is about God. So my calling and your calling is to attend, whether you're a preacher or not, is to attend to what the Bible says about God. The Bible is not about the religious imagination of ancient peoples or the political purposes of the biblical redactors or the program for social activism or a collection of colorful characters or an anthology of wisdom about developing your spiritual practices. Watch out for that word, practices. I'm being deliberately provocative here in order to highlight the point. The Bible is first, last, and always the word God, meaning the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible has arisen out of what God has said. Now, in case that any of you are feeling smug, this, this slippage from theology into anthropology affects everyone on the ecclesiastical spectrum. Case in point, my friend Jim Kay, who was professor of homiletics and then academic dean at Princeton Theological Seminary, told me a story. His position required him to listen to an endless stream of student sermons as he taught homiletics. <laughs> One of his students was a hyper-confident Bible Belt evangelical who thought he could out-preach everybody else in the class. So Jim K. listened <coughs> to his first practice sermon. When the time came for the evaluation, I think he could barely conceal his exasperation. <laughs> do you realize, he said to the cocky young preacher, do you realize that in your sermon, God was not the subject of a single sentence? When Jim told me that story, I realized right away that it was one of those revelatory moments. I had already published two books of sermons at that point. But after that, I started, I started watching for the subject of the verb much more carefully and much more consistently. Here's the scripture text from Galatians. Listen to Paul and the subject of the verb. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were in bondage to beings that by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God. 
how can you turn back again? Do you see how Paul catches himself? He's dictating. He catches himself mixing up the subject of the object and corrects himself in mid-sentence. He goes from, you have come to know God, to, or rather, to be known by God. I have found that in a Bible study group, it's an excellent exercise to ask participants to practice the same maneuver so that they will soon <coughs> learn to say, instead of I found God, they will learn to say, God found me. Third counter affirmation a God who is active in the world. This is perhaps the most basic point of dispute that I see anyway between liberal theology and biblical theology. This, the disagreement is centered, centered on <coughs> questions like this. Is God active in the world? Does he intervene in our lives? Does the Bible still carry with it the living word, addressing us today with a new creation ex nihilo from nothing? In one of her letters, that indispensable Christian writer, Flannery O'Connell, has this to say. She wrote this in a letter. We have come to believe that God has no power, that he cannot reveal himself to us, and that religion is our own sweet invention. Well, that was written about 40 years ago, but it is more true then than it was, I mean, it is more true now than it was then. If we went around asking people in the churches, if they thought that God had no power, they might say, of course they don't think they have. But more often than that, it is belied by actual sermons, especially in the endings of sermons. The sermons that I hear, I've never heard anybody here preach, so don't feel picked on. <laughs> <laughs> the endings of many sermons, I find, lack power the preacher will begin very promisingly, and then somewhere along the line, the voice drops, and the energy dribbles away, and the ending lacks power. I believe this is a theological ailment. This, I believe. What's missing is a fundamental trust in the power of the Word of God to create something fresh, even as the preacher speaks. More specifically, we really don't expect the Word to precipitate a break with the order of things as they are. We're so used to things as they are, we like them that way. What's missing in so much preaching is the confidence that God reveals himself in an apocalypse of Jesus Christ, a revelation of Jesus Christ, as the ruler of the cosmos and judge over all the earth. That will be the subject of my third lecture, God willing. This apocalypse of Jesus Christ, this apocalypse of the word of God, should call forth confidence from preachers. Confidence. When this confidence is lacking, the congregation leaves the church feeling that nothing particular has happened. They have been exhorted, perhaps, or instructed, or entertained, but no event has taken place. In this context, I do believe that preachers need to pay more attention to sermon endings. Like the conclusion of Jesus' parables, the sermon ending should challenge the listeners into a new way of thinking. The ending should require something of the preacher also, because the word of God is a two-edged sword. It requires of the preacher the courage to face the possibility of rejection. This is not easy. The congregation has a part to play in this. Now, in the Episcopal Church, most sermons on Jesus Sunday nowadays that I hear are stories about Jesus. This is a great advance from the earlier days in the mid-century Episcopal Church, when the name of Jesus was hardly mentioned at all in the Episcopal Church. That has really changed. In the current prayer book set up in our church, 
a passage from the Synoptic Gospels, much less often John, is read first, and the sermon immediately follows, and it's about Jesus' sayings and Jesus' doings, as we've just heard in the story. But strangely, although there is definitely a Christology of the Synoptic Gospels, it has been pushed into the background, or ignored, or forgotten in these sermons. And just to give you an example, I've probably heard 50 or 60 sermons, at least 50 or 60 sermons on the Transfiguration in my church-going life. I'm 82, so that's I probably maybe I've heard 70 sermons on the Transfiguration. No kidding. And uh, most of them have missed the point. Most of them have known about Peter. Don't we love dear old blundering Peter? Here he, here he goes again. He always gets it wrong. The disciples of Jesus always get it wrong. They can't stay on the mountaintop. We must go down from the mountaintop and face life in the valley. And that has become the standard transfiguration sermon, as far as I am. A friend of mine wrote me that he was tired of hearing sermons that dump on the disciples. But Peter and the disciples are only a secondary feature of this great story. In the transfiguration scene, the focus is on the glory of the face of Jesus Christ. The presence of the law and the prophets of Elijah and Moses. And the affirmation of the Father, this is my beloved Son. And God says, listen to him. Not look at him. Listen to him. Listen to his word. <clears throat> now this is one of the differences between the Jesus charisma and the Christ charisma. The Christ charisma focuses on the main thing, which is the nature of Jesus Christ himself, his identity as one with the Father. So the primary function of the kerygma in this case is not an exhortation to be less dense than Peter was. It is not a call to get down into the valley. It is not a call to greater effort. It is not a call to anything except to the person of Christ Jesus who is already present and acting as the story is preached, calling us to faith in himself, to listen to him, and in him to listen for the word of God. Spiritual programs and social action grow out of the charisma. It is fatal to make the charisma dependent upon the spiritual programs and the social action. Fifth and last counter-proposal. The word of God is urgent. Anna Cara Florence has said, the congregation may not be convinced, but they must know that you are convinced. So often the congregation suspects that the preacher is not convinced. David Lowe's, who teaches preaching at Luther Seminary, observed that John Wesley, in his preaching, seemed to have something at stake. Someone's life may depend upon the message. The great George Whitfield said, I preached as one never to preach again, a dying man to dying man. Moreover, an urgent message expects a response. It is the vulnerable, at-risk language of relationship, the language of love. Rejection is a real possibility. The ending of every song, I believe, every song, should be a last bid effort, devil take the hindmost, do or die attempt on the part of the preacher. Many clergy need encouragement from their congregation 
in order to bring passion and conviction into the pool. I knew a clergyman quite well, who for many years had a comfortable position as rector of a prominent, affluent Episcopal parish. Is there any other kind? <laughs> <laughs> it's right up the road from where my husband and I live, so we know him and we know his congregation. Well, the lay leaders of this church keep him on, kept him, he's not there anymore, he's retired. The lay leaders of his church kept him on a tight leash. He was literally afraid of his own congregation. I know him well enough to know that in his heart, he personally believed in a high Christology and a powerful word. But he wouldn't say so from the pulpit in that church. Now how do I know this? I know it because on two separate occasions, people whom I know came to him to do a funeral and they asked him, please preach a convicted biblical sermon. And he did. He would do it if he was asked, but he wouldn't do it on Sunday morning. On Sunday morning, the faces of his state Episcopal congregation looked like Queen Elizabeth's countenance during Bishop Curry's sermon. <laughs> <laughs> you saw that, right? <laughs> I'm a huge admirer of Queen Elizabeth, but oh brother, she really has a, well. <laughs> Be with us all today, tomorrow, and forever. 